tomorrow for Saturday, April 19th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is my beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham. I almost said Thursday, by the way. Thursday. That's, that's how long ago I my heard brain Friday. just went. Okay. My, well, I almost did. Oh, man. Well, it's, it's, we're clearly in season four. We're clear. Oh, yes, we're clearly in season four episode. This is season seven, episode 11. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone who helped make this particular episode happen. These are the Space Fig Cast premiere members. These are people who have contributed at least $10 to this episode to make this happen. So $10 or above at patreon.com slash TMRO. And you'll see both names on the screen, Space Vidcast and Tomorrow, as we transition away from Space Vidcast and over to Tomorrow. So once again, huge thank you to all the Space Vidcast patrons. Let's go ahead and get started with some space news. Um, there was an Atlas V launch with the National Reconnaissance uh, Office's NROL 67 launch. It was classified. And uh, here was, <laughs> here is some launch footage, maybe. Did you lose? Four, there you go. three, two, we have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying NROL 67 for the National Reconnaissance Office. Now, we don't know a whole lot about this particular payload. It's, it is classified. I can tell you a little bit about the vehicle. It's the 541 configuration and what those numbers mean. The first number in the, the five means it's a five meter fairing. The second number, a four, means that it is a, so it could be, a, the first number could be a five or a four. It can be a four meter fairing or five meter fairing. The second number, a four, means there are so, four solid motors attached to this, as, uh, attached to the boost stage. So there are additional four solid motors um, around the outside of the vehicle. And the last one, a one, that indicates how many uh, Centaur engines are on the uh, upper stage. So that could be a one or a two. So this is uh, the only, I believe the only other time we flew a 541 was for Curiosity going to Mars. Uh, yeah, that, that's my understanding as well, uh, which is kind of interesting considering that most likely this is just a satellite that's going on or that's going on that is on board. Uh, it's not necessarily another Mars rover. Although again, being classified, uh, technically we don't really know. It could be, it could be <laughs> anything, but it's, yeah, most likely a satellite, probably fairly large. Um, you know, we were talking about it earlier, the, if it was larger, it would have probably gone into Delta IV Heavy, so the, the Delta IV does have more uh, lift capacity than an Atlas V, but still a pretty decent sized payload. Um, this particular vehicle has over 2 million pounds of thrust, uh, so it's a, it's a pretty big bad. Bad. This is the 12th Atlas mission in a row to go on its first attempt, which is, I mean, kudos, because that's not easy, as you can imagine. Absolutely. So moving along, we have some more launch coverage. We also have a Soyuz U launch, and a Soyuz U being one of the older design vehicles has something crazy. Actually, check out the sidebar for the Soyuz U. It's got, I forgot how many, but it's like over 700 launch attempts. Check it out here. Yeah. Rocket engines are very loud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That happens. That happens. <laughs> and this was a Russian built imaging satellite. This launched last Wednesday. And like I said, that was a Soyuz U rocket. It's the, uh, this was the uh, EgyptSat 2. Mm -hmm. uh, it's owned by Egypt's National Authority for Remote Sensing and Space Sciences. Uh, basically, it's a government satellite going up there. It's going to be an Earth-viewing telescope with a camera capable of spotting surface features like uh, small, as small as one meter. Um, so really high-end, high-end optics. Yeah, high resolution, uh, visible. Pointed back at us. In Pointed both visible us. and infrared wavelengths, which I thought was really cool. And then the, the big news coming out this last week, SpaceX launched the CRS-3 mission. Now, this particular clip um, a couple things. First, I wasn't sure how to do the sidebar for this one because Falcon 9, uh, the Falcon 9 uh, rocket in, has had nine flights in, if you combine 1.0 and 1.1 1 .1 configurations. One of those flights was successful with its primary payload, right. but didn't, wasn't successful as a secondary payload. Right. So I marked it as a success, but I was, it's like, it's actually like 8.5 successes. There you go. I should, I probably, that's probably how I should have marked yeah. it. But here you go. Here's the, here's the launch coverage. And it was really long because uh, of Dragon, so we kind of cut it down for you. Here, check this out. Four, 
three, two, one, zero. Lift off of the Falcon 9. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. First stage propulsion is nominal. Stage separation confirmed. And we have Miko 1. And have that ignition. Okay, I can deploy confirmed. No, I basically stay in this shot for way long. But the other shots I kind of cut away from because. So it's so gorgeous. It's so pretty. I just it's love this so shot. Pretty. I think it looks really, really cool. So we just kind of let it float out there, kind of doing its thing. <sighs> Yeah, now after this, uh, we do actually show solar array deploy. So you can see on the side of the vehicle, there are kind of those two s square things. Those are uh, fairings that are covering the current solar panels. Those are gonna break away, and then those solar panels are actually going to uh, fold out. So those fold out giving, uh, and they're, they're on the Dragon trunk section, and that's gonna give power to the Dragon spacecraft while it's on orbit. Um, and that trunk section is left in space uh, to burn up. Uh, only at the very end of the mission do they detach from the trunk section. I just shot a mission control. <laughs> you can see a dragon hanging in the background there. Check this out. And boom. So the neat thing about this mission that we haven't really touched on yet is it had landing legs. This is, so far as I know, the first spacecraft to actually have landing legs on it. Um, outside of like a test program in Texas. So right. um, the, what SpaceX is doing here is they're taking the first stage, they're detaching it, once it detaches from the second stage, they're mm -hmm. turning it around, refiring the engines, and bringing it back down to Earth in hopes that they can recover the stage, refuel it, and reuse it. This was a demonstration mission to see how much of that technology they think actually works at this point. Right. And so when you looked at the launch footage, you saw those four legs kind of around the base of the unit. That's what those legs are for. Those are actually, those um, deploy from the vehicle, from the side of the vehicle. And um, it's supposed to land on land. Now, because they're still in the development stages, the early stages of this, they're doing it over the ocean, right? right. So just, just to be safe. Now, um, be, the way this works is the, the stage continues to go up and over, so it, it kind of gets out of range of a lot of the ground stations. So there were some chase planes and whatnot trying to get telemetry from the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Elon Musk, he's uh, on his Twitter account at least, he says, data upload from the tracking plane shows the landing in the Atlantic was good. Several boats en route through heavy seas, and they were very heavy seas, so it was difficult for the, the craft to get there. They were hoping to actually be able to recover the stage out at sea, but. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to do when the seas are heavy. Right. Uh, then a little bit later on, he also said, uh, flight computers continued transmitting for eight seconds after reaching the water, stopped when the booster went horizontal. Basically indicating that uh, the, the thought process here is that the, the stage did come down and basically hovered and like hit the, hit the ocean, mm -hmm. right? It, like it was supposed to nulled out of its rate and then just stopped. And if it were on land, it would have just landed at that point. Right, because there wasn't been solid ground there wasn't on land, it was over the ocean, right. and so then it sank. You know, it hit the ocean, and now it becomes this giant pressurized buoy, so it kind of doink, and then, you know, tips and goes horizontal. And you, interesting fact, not mm. a lot of people know this, this is a true rocket science, computers don't like water. Oh. Weird, right? So uh, I think when the computers yeah, were exposed so to weird. the water, uh, bad things happened at that point, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, uh, the landing seems like on the surface it worked well. Now to give you an idea as to what that would look like over land, not only did SpaceX successfully launch Falcon 9 1.1 for the first time with Dragon on it, mm -hmm. successfully launched for the first time Falcon 9 1.1 with legs on it, potentially successfully bring that stage back down to Earth, mm -hmm. and at, had it been over land, they could have possibly, right, we don't have enough data yet, right. they could have possibly recovered that entire mm -hmm. stage, which would be a first. Uh, they also then have a test in Texas mm -hmm. where they've got the 1.1 configuration where they're actually doing it and actually landing it back down on land. Here's the F9 or, so we've retired Grasshopper at this point. Correct. We've moved on to F9 or Dev 1. Mm -hmm. Here's footage of F9 or Dev 1. Check this out. 
Now on the right hand side, that's the old Grasshopper you can see. So that's the retired Grasshopper vehicle on the right as we move towards F9 or Dev 1. It does kind of remind me a little bit of the, uh, the really wonderful shot of the two space shuttles on the two different launch pads. Yeah. That's kind of what that opening shot reminded me of a yeah, little bit. This is a quadcopter shot, so this is a, uh, a camera that's flying up in the air. So beautiful. This footage is amazing. This was a 250 meter hop. So it lights its engines, jumps 250 meters, hovers for a moment. Now those are the actual legs. Those, those are the same legs that we, had, we would have on a, a real vehicle. I see we, I mean SpaceX. Right. Oh, it's just crazy. And watch this right back down. Boom. That's over a 10-story building that they just launched and landed with precision. <laughs> That's what F-9 is going to be doing. Unreal. Uh, and so SpaceX proved that they can do it through the atmosphere now mm -hmm. with uh, CRS-3 mission, that Correct. they can come back, they can land it with fairly good precision over the ocean. Right. Um, now it's, it's time to start taking those stages and landing them back on land. I don't yeah. know when they're going to start asking for that. I don't know. Maybe they're going to do it over the ocean a few more times. I have right. no idea. Uh, but that's going to be really cool when they're finally able to actually start bringing stages back. I'm, I'm super excited for that. But in addition, this is a SpaceX heavy show, man. Uh, it is, and and just because you know, There's SpaceX doesn't have SpaceX enough news. to do apparently, and so they just decided to do everything all at the same time. It's really what it comes down to. Uh, SpaceX uh, signed the 20-year lease on pad 39A, uh, which is at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, you'll recognize the name 39A from being one of the space shuttle landing, or landing, launching pads. <laughs> <laughs> and well, landed nearby. I suppose. To land back at the pad, that'd be kind of cool, <laughs> I'm though. I'm usually used to everything, you know, launching and landing all in the same place anymore. Uh, yeah, so SpaceX has uh, SLC 39A, which is really cool, and like I said, for a 20-year lease is really incredible. Uh, Falcon Heavy is said, or is slated to be launching from pad 39a early as early as next year early next year early 2015 is uh what we're hearing uh gwen shotwell the president of spacex said that we'll make really great use of this pad i promise yeah. we've had architects and our launch site engineers team working for many months on the sidelines and we'll plan we will launch falcon heavy from here first from this pad early next year which is really really exciting uh this is another launch site now under spacex's belt as they are launching from vandenberg air force base here in california they've also launched from the uh, air force base the cape canaveral air force base air force station i apologize which is a little bit south of kennedy space center and now they will have the kennedy space center uh launch pad which is really exciting yeah, so, uh, and actually it was brought up in the chat room where they're like, look, you can say you work for SpaceX. Uh, we try to avoid saying that uh, because uh, while I do have a day job, actually we both have day jobs at SpaceX, uh, this show has nothing to do with SpaceX, so we can't give you inside SpaceX information that's not public, and this, the, any opinions on this show are the opinions of this show, as you saw in the, in the little thing in the front of the show, and not that of SpaceX. And since this is such a SpaceX heavy show, I didn't want to point that out. We do work for SpaceX, but this is not a SpaceX show. They have no idea what we're saying here. We, our opinions are our own and not that of SpaceX. Um, I will say, though, in my opinion, a SpaceX getting slick 39A is a pretty cool thing. That's I'm really excited for SpaceX really to have incredible. access to that pad. And uh, somebody had asked, they were like, oh, how long is that lease for? And I said, you know, I, offhand, I, I don't actually know. When I looked at it and said it was a 20-year lease, I, I, nearly, I nearly fell to the floor myself. <laughs> I thought that was really... Um, really impressive, and uh, it is to be noted that SpaceX will be using their own money to keep up and uh, maintain or do any sort of changes to Pad 39A themselves. NASA isn't paying for that, so just figured I should point now, that out. We're over on time, but I want to get to it anyhow because sure. I think it's a big deal, and that is we found Earth's cousin planet we're about 500 light years away from here. Uh, the reason uh, for me that this is exciting is it's about the same size as Earth. It's a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. It's got about the right amount of light. It's in the Goldilocks zone. All of these things seem to be kind of adding up. This is the first time we found something that could really, truly, potentially have life on it. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't really know what the atmosphere makeup is. We're, we're going to know that because uh, this was found by Kepler. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to understand that better once the James Webb Space Telescope launches. And... and 
once J-Dub, well, it's supposed to go up in 2018. It's supposed to go up in like 20, hold on, I don't um, know. So uh, once J-Dub ST goes up, we'll actually be able to look at the composition of the atmosphere and understand, right. is there liquid water on there? Is there, uh, are there the ingredients to make life as we know it? Mm -hmm. And there's a strong possibility that those answers are yes. Uh, consider that for a moment. At 500 million light years away, too long for us to get there, there could be alien life, intelligent alien life looking back at us right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know they could be more advanced than us, they could be just as advanced as us, they could be way less advanced th than us, but the light that we're seeing from them, if we were to get the most uber awesome telescope ever and be able to zoom in on their planet, which we don't have, but zoom all the way in on their planet, you know that light would be 50, I'm sorry, 500 million years old. Right. 500, five, that was, it'd be 500 years old, I'm sorry. That was like 500 million light years. No, it'd be 500 years old. That light would be 500 years old. Right. And if you can imagine humanity going backwards 500 years, that's what they would be seeing if they looked at us. So it, it's just kind of cool to, to think about those distances, to think about what could actually be on the planet. I thought that this was an exciting story. The reason this is called uh, Earth's cousin and not Earth's twin is because uh, it's on the cooler side of the Goldilocks zone, if you will. The, uh, the planet itself is going around, a, I believe it's a red dwarf host, uh, which is a little bit dimmer, a little bit cooler uh, than our sun. So it's on the colder side, so they don't know exactly what the temperatures are, but still not like iceberg. It's not in an ice age or anything like that. It's not that kind of cold. Um, so pardon me. So that's really exciting. Um, and they, they think that it's a 1.1 times the diameter of Earth, and its year would have about 130 days, which is kind of cool. Which is why we need to come up with a good measure of time. All right, on that note, uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna be. How would you talk? How would you describe our, our main topic? Uh, Kurzweilian? No, it would be. Uh, it's a little bit Kurzweilian. It's a little bit. Um, uh, uh, what is it? The singularity. Yeah, a little the, bit. A little, little bit. A little bit. The future of humans and how it kind of relates to space. So stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. <laughs> it's kind of fun to say. Uh, <laughs> before before we get into our main topic, I wanted to really give a special thank you to the uh, patrons of tomorrow who helped make this episode go. Uh, these are the uh, tomorrow producers. Uh, these are people who have contributed. They're between the producers of tomorrow. Producers of tomorrow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I need to because I'm so used to saying uh, space vidcast producers. The producers right. of tomorrow who have uh, contributed. Um, at least $5 to the show, $5 and over, to make this specific episode happen. And if you'd like to help make Space Vidcast go, because we are a community-funded show, you can go over to patreon.com slash tmro for more information. For those of you wondering, we do have actually a forward from the old uh, Patreon slash Space Vidcast over to tmro. Uh, for if, if you're watching the show and going, what the heck is tomorrow? Um, last week's show describes it, but then I'll talk about it again a little bit in the third third segment, so check for the next after the next commercial break. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, becoming immortal. Uh, the way these main topics work, you, you'll notice we kind of go on these themes, right? Mm -hmm. The way these main topics work is it, we're just talking about stuff, because mm -hmm. we talk about space and human colonization of Mars and distant civilizations and stuff like that outside of the show, outside of work all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually- We're a very intellectual <laughs> couple. Something. <laughs> we do something. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, one of the things that was brought up is a product called Soylent mm -hmm. that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And it is not people, so that's Soylent Green. Uh, what it is, is it is, a, it is a food substitute. The idea being that you don't need to eat you just take Soylent and it's everything that you need to sustain your life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is really cool because we may need this if we're going to go explore Mars. Because right. food, food, especially if you can generate it on uh, your spacecraft or on, on Mars, food was going to take a lot of mass and, and payload. If we right. can minimize that, how awesome is that? And that started other conversations of, well, you know, what does the body really need? How can we advance and, and modify humans so that we are more adaptable to space? Mm -hmm. uh, other things that it brought up are like uh, sleeping. Mm -hmm. you know, what a huge waste of time. Wouldn't it be awesome if we no longer required sleep? Mm -hmm. Air. 
right? But it wouldn't be cool if we could oxygenate our blood without actually having oxygen around us. Mm -hmm. Uh, stuff like that and so we started kind of and then and then that leads naturally into okay well now you've done all these things what about extending human life right what about becoming I don't want to say immortal because you could still be killed by a you know right this isn't a Highlander sort of situation well there can be only one <laughs> there can be only one right but but it is, uh, it is we are getting to the point where we can modify things to our advantage mm -hmm. and you know we can live longer and longer and uh, uh roy kurzweil roy ray ray kurzweil i'm like Whoa. ray kurzweil um pretty popular in this kind of area mm -hmm. is basically saying there's going to be this singularity event mm -hmm. where uh, it's, it's all kind of i guess uh, i'm going to do a terrible job of explaining this all kind of comes to a head mm -hmm. and we will essentially be able to live forever mm -hmm. maybe not in these bodies right but somehow some way we will be able to continue to go on and that's the main topic of the show and i know you were looking up some stuff before the show yeah yeah uh jason silva does these really cool uh short videos that he calls shots of awe and uh some of you may know him from brain games and he, he does a lot of interesting things uh but there are two particular quotes that actually aren't even his quotes but as i was watching some of his videos uh, that he was quoting other people that really sort of spoke to this, at least to me. Um, and he quoted Alan Harrington from The Immortalist saying, death has become an imposition on the human race and is no longer acceptable. Well, the thought behind, so the argument against that yes. is going to be that you need death. If, if, if we are to believe um, Darwin yes. and that you need evolution, yes. then you need death right. so that you can get rid of the old and replace it with the new. Sure. Absolutely. And I think the argument for that, if you will, to uh, not having death is that uh, we will be able to do all of these different modifications, not just uh, to better our food source or better our food supply and bettering ourselves, but then making ourselves more intelligent and having this sort of coming together, this singularity of not just the human uh, intelligence and humankind, but also the uh, electronic and uh, you know artificial intelligence and what have you. And through those modifications that you are still evolving, you are still changing, you are still becoming better, uh, that, you know, we've sort of reached a head to a certain extent uh, in, in the capacity that we have for the natural evolution of, uh, you know, say our intelligence or say our, uh, our, our humanity to a certain extent. There, we can go off of um, the dangers of all of these sorts of things if you like, but in the sort of utopian as opposed to dystopian view, I think, and that's where I live, Star Trek forever, thank you, uh, that <laughs> that uh, you will still be able to make these modifications as we continue to learn more about them. Does that sure. make sense? But that also then uh, kind of assumes that either we need to consume less because if, if no one dies, we will begin consuming more and more of our own planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a point where the planet can no longer sustain that level of humanity. I don't know what that point is, but there is some point where humanity exceeds the planetary resources, mm -hmm. which then forces us to go out to space, or we need to change our level of consumption. Yes, uh, yeah, although I think it is kind or both. of, or both. sure, I, I think it's an interesting idea when you start talking about uh, one of the sort of arguments against humans in space versus robots in space is that uh, you can always rebuild a robot and you can't rebuild a human. Once a human is dead, I mean, that's it. You can replace it with a different human, but that one may not be as sharp in these different areas. It may not be, you know, may not have the studies or what have you. So before you start getting into cloning and what have you, that's a whole nother fun thing to talk about. Uh, you know, just extending the life of the original human. Sure. Right? But what, what's to prevent us from, say, when you look at humans going out into space, mm -hmm. what's to say that? it's going to be this form that we go out to into space in so it's likely in the near term mm -hmm. this is what we're going to use humans like this will sure. make it to mars mm -hmm. right we're going to go to the moon we're going to go to mars but if we want to go much further than that our lifespan is too short and even if we extend it um who's to say that it's going to be able to extend it long enough why does it have to be in this form why can't we find a way to download our consciousness into a robot essentially 
And then that, and then you essentially live forever in this other form. Well, and then maybe we will. I mean, maybe, uh, so uh, quoting Eric Davis, saying that the human design process will achieve a kind of infinite velocity. Everything becomes linked with everything else, and matter becomes mind. So I think that's kind of, I think he's speaking towards that sort of idea. Um, there's a movie coming out, Johnny Depp movie called Transcendence, and, uh, you know, this very, very intelligent man, and they're talking about... Um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, I was just going to say AI, so I apologize, I want to spell that out for you, artificial intelligence, and uh, something, something, something happens here, and then his brain gets uploaded to this AI consciousness, and sort of, he lives on through it, if you will, um, and I, I think uh, there are parts of the singularity that speak to those sorts of things, um, there's... You know, the more that science looks into the way the human brain makes connections and the way that we have humanly designed circuit boards and how similar a lot of those different things are, there's a lot of this sort of something that occurs in nature and just naturally that's the way that we've decided to, or is the best way to design it in, in hardware, if that, if that, mm -hmm. if you can follow that much. Um, and how similar those two things are, and how interesting that is. And uh, I, I don't know, I think the, the idea of immortality or the extension of human life beyond what uh, is naturally occurring already, because we as humans have started to, uh, to live longer than we had before, mm -hmm. right? You go back, you go back 500 years, and humans, the average lifespan really wasn't much past 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. Right. And now we're living into 80s, hundreds, hundreds, not just a hundred. Remember, I remember growing up and well, watching. It's not, it's not hundreds, plural. It's no, over no, I suppose it's not hundreds, plural. You're right. I apologize for that. Uh, but I, I do remember when I was younger watching the Today Show and it was like a, a completely unheard of when somebody reached 100 years old. It was like the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard anymore. And then, uh, and now it's like, oh yeah, 110, 111, 114. You're like, oh, that's crazy. Just in my lifetime, people are are continuing to age longer, mm -hmm. um, and in better health. It's not like they're they're hooked up. They're not a vegetable at 114. As if that. No, uh, my, my, I mean, some of them are questionable, but. Sure. I don't know. I, I just I find it really really fascinating, um, and particularly for a long term travel. Uh, you know, to go out to other galaxies and what have you, uh, that, you know, maybe we don't need to be asleep the entire time. Maybe we can just be alive, Star Trek Voyager style. Yeah, and actually, Chuck 4E said we need stasis pods for long trips into space, but maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Although, wouldn't that be painfully boring? Like, spending five, let's just say we could get a ship to go uh, the speed of light, which... I understand their problems there, but let's pretend for a moment we could do that. It's still 500 years for us to go and explore the the, the planet that Kepler found. Right. 500 years. Well, I, I guess the, the the sci-fi side of it, if you will, for a moment, is that uh, if you and I set out on this trek that we know is going to take 500 years to get there. Yeah. But once we get there, it's still you and I who get to see that stuff. You and I. Not our ancestors, not our, our great grandchildren, great 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 grandchildren, because we wrote stories about how cool we think it's going to be when, once we get there, and then those crazy long down the line descendants get there and go, this is crap. <laughs> Why did we even set out on this thing? Versus you and I getting there and going, this is crap. Why did we do this? <laughs> those are two completely different things. And we talked about, um, you know, the Juno mission, which we we love, and, and we thought that that was really cool. But, you know, one of the questions was, hey, doesn't that kind of suck to work on a project? I mean, yeah, you got to see it go off the ground, but you're never going to see, you're literally never going to see results from this project other than making it go. And it's going to take X amount of years to get the information and then Y amount of years to get the information back and then Z amount of years to analyze the information. And you're never going to get those answers and doesn't that suck? And here's an opportunity to get those answers. 
Well, not yet. I mean, we can't do any of this. No, not yet. But, I mean, somebody said that, you know, life only has meaning because of death. And I, I don't... Actually, that was said in the chat room. I know. I saw that. Yeah. And I, I apologize, but I, I respectfully disagree. Um, there are plenty of people here that I absolutely love and enjoy and plenty of things here that I, I love and enjoy. And if I lived longer, then I could see more of those things and more of those people and enjoy all of that even more. Just because... Uh, something is going to die doesn't mean that that's the reason that I love it or that I'm going to die and that's the reason that I love it. I love because I love or I enjoy because I enjoy. Um, and I, I don't I don't find that there's necessarily more meaning in life because of death. Um, I, I mean, we can disagree on that and that's I'm totally happy with that. Uh, do I do I personally want to live forever? No, I mean, I can definitely see downfalls in that or 500 years or whatever the case is. But um, again, and for the optimist, and I live in this utopian Star Trek universe, um, I think it's great. And so that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'd, like to, we'd like to know what you guys think. Uh, what is the future of humanity, especially as it relates to space? Is this something that we're going to be forced to, to do? Uh, and is it, you know, if, in other words, if we, as we start to grow longer, uh, grow older, are we going to be forced to go out and uh, find other habitable homes such as Mars, although not habitable today? Um, are we going to just go out and explore the solar system? What, what are we going to do with this? Can we do anything? Because it, there, it does seem like our, our lifespans are getting ever increasingly longer. So what does that mean for the future of humanity? Uh, leave your comments on YouTube, uh, on the tomorrow.tv, tmro.tv website, or wherever you'd like. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from the last show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One, zero, lift off. The fleet of space shuttles were doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back to tomorrow. <laughs> that's that's still fun to say. I'd like to thank all the uh, patrons of tomorrow for making this episode happen. This is anyone who spent one dollar or more on this episode, and you can get more information on that at Patreon.com/tm. R O and this uh, you get more perks other than just your name in the show. There's also some uh, some chat one-on-one -on -one chats with us and a few other things that we make happen. Every dollar helps. Every single dollar helps. We are a community-driven show, and uh, you help pay for us to do this stuff and uh, do it week after week. Uh, one neat thing uh, that we did with uh, Patreon is this last week, we or between these last two weeks, we did get a new audio board, and we did get new microphones. So you see the microphone in the middle is missing. Um, I don't think we have the right element. It came as a kit, and it came with an omnidirectional. So if you've been having audio issues for this show, uh, we'll work on that. We'll get a uh, different um, cardioid mic so we narrow it down, make it a little less roomy, um, and I think we'll be able to get a little more volume out of it that way. Um, also, I have a head cold, so my volume is a little messed up right now. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll work on it. We'll get it going, and it's uh, the patrons who help make that all of that happen. Um, I did also say that I was going to talk about uh, TMRO versus Space Vidcast. So TMRO is pronounced tomorrow. Uh, we are changing the name of Space Vidcast over to tomorrow because um, I think it better in, uh, encompasses what we're all about and who we are. Uh, and I always hated the name Space Vidcast, fundamentally, at the end of the day. So we've begun that transition uh, as of uh, the last show, which was two weeks ago. And um, uh, you'll start seeing like our Twitter account. It's still at Space Vidcast, but it's all labeled TMRO. Um, we, I've got an updated Facebook page. We've got all of this stuff getting updated to TMRO, including the Patreon page at patreon.com slash TMRO. So that's what's going on. Uh, hopefully you like the new name. Um, I realize it's a change and people hate change in general, but uh, I think over time it, it will be, I think it is a better change and over time I think it'll make a lot more sense for us. So let's go ahead and get some uh, into some of the comments from um, our last show. This one comes from uh, Stephen Grimsley, who says, about that terraforming idea on Mars, unless you can heat up Mars' core to a similar temperature of Earth's core, or have another splendid way to recreate a gigantic freaking magnetic field, then you have no chance of terraforming Mars. The sun blasts of all, uh, sun blasts of all but the most heaviest of gases from its atmosphere. In other words, carbon dioxide, which is the reason why Mars' thin atmosphere only has, uh, has only carbon dioxide. Sure. Colonizing Mars equals possible uh, a capsule dome underground structure, so forth and so on. Terraforming Mars, not really possible. So the, the, 
the, the, summing that up, basically saying that solar radiation, solar wind is going to blow your atmosphere away. And that's not untrue because there's no magnetosphere to Mars. Right. There's no, the, Mars is truly a dead planet. The planet is dead. The uh, magnetic core is, has stopped. And uh, so once we think it was a thriving planet with water, possibly life, we don't know. Uh, when the core stopped and the planet died, most likely life died on the planet with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the argument being terraforming Mars is impossible because you don't have that, that magnetosphere. Right. Well, and while it is true that the, the atmosphere will blow away with solar winds, mm -hmm. um, it's not going to blow away all at once. It's not like all of a sudden a, solar, a gust of solar wind comes and takes all of your atmosphere away. It will take a very long time for that to happen. So if we can add atmosphere to rate faster mm -hmm. than it is getting taken out of, you could, in theory, terraform Mars. Now, I do not know what those numbers are, and I could absolutely be wrong. Mm -hmm. So I openly admit Maybe I'm full of it, but my thought process, and what I've heard at least, is it is possible to terraform Mars so long as you maintain that atmosphere somehow. Mm -hmm. And that's the trick. Is you, unlike Earth that self-maintains, Mars you will have to maintain yourself. So there's that. Uh, George Day says, the Russia-U.S. situation is silly. NASA should, ooh, that was, that was kind of good, is that was, silly. That was really good. Uh, the uh, NASA should have put their foot down and said no to the suspension of contact with Russia. Space does equal politics, but how do you say what is ISS is and is not? They could just put ISS on the subject line of an email and get them to read your email. If this goes further and they say more, no more launches for you, U.S., uh, They'll back SpaceX into a corner and rush the development of a human program. Advantageous or not, I'll let you decide. So basically, this is silly. This is politics uh, getting in the way of science. And how do you determine what's part of the ISS and what's not part of the ISS? Because in a way, most everything NASA touches is part of the ISS. So I think they actually have operations that determine what are considered critical ops for ISS that uh, there were that, that they could yeah I think things get scaled back down to critical ops yeah essentially uh, I, I don't actually know I, I don't necessarily disagree either it is absolutely politics kind of getting in the way of science here um, it makes me sad that this is happening but it's happening so uh, and I don't think you can really back SpaceX into a corner it takes X amount of time to develop stuff and that, that just is what it is right you, you that's there you go. <laughs> uh, Joe says, I can't believe how much time you guys spent talking about how we can't start a manned space program until 2016 or 2017 when we already have the proven Dragon capsule, which is probably the safest spacecraft ever built and is on schedule to be certified in 2015. You talked about every option other than the most re reasonable and most likely and most prepared one. Um, well, I, I'm not sure where you're actually getting your information. Uh, so SpaceX is in fact working on crew rating the Dragon, but they have never said, tw well, if they have said 2015, that's not their current estimate. SpaceX is saying 2016, 2017, which is the same time frame that we have been saying for everything else. Um, and, you know, Proven Dragon capsule, safest spacecraft ever, kind of subjective terms, right? So I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Soyuz is very much so proven, and right. I mean, it's de depends on how you define safe, I suppose. Um, we haven't killed anyone in a while, I <laughs> guess, on Soyuz. I, I mean, you know, as opposed to uh, humans have never flown on Dragon, so saying that uh, Dragon crew is proven or safe. Uh, is really hard to determine. Uh, like Ben said, SpaceX is working on certifying it, you know, having it be human rated. Uh, but yeah, what those time frames are and, and, and what have you, it's just. Yeah, it's not, it's not 2015. And you know, and it's, a cargo yeah. vehicle is different than a crew vehicle. There are, there are differences, even if the. Well, even if it's certified in 2015, I don't, I don't, it's not like signing a lease on a car and now you get to go drive it now. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, all right, cool, yep, we checked all the boxes. Goodbye, Have go have fun with that. Um, you know, there's just, yeah, uh, there's so much that goes into it, I suppose. Uh, you have to train astronauts, and, and uh, you know, astronauts have to be okay to be put onto the capsule and where you're going, and you don't just fly people to fly people anymore. This isn't Apollo, uh, or I suppose Gemini. <laughs> uh, you know, there's all those sorts of things, so it's, it's, it's not... It's not as simple as you're making it out to sound, I suppose. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, this comes from Matt A, who says, I was wondering if tomorrow could also be an acronym. Here's one idea to get the creative process flowing. TMR, 
TMRO, Terrestrial Matters, Reflections and Observations. I actually, I thought this was an interesting idea. I don't really want to turn it into an acronym, but I love the idea of a space podcast or tomorrow, patron, the community of tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Dude, seven years of saying space podcasters. I, know. I didn't go. say a single thing. I love the idea of the community of tomorrow coming up with different acronyms as to what TMRO could mean. I think that'd be a lot of fun. So, uh, in your comments, uh, just give me acronyms. I think it would be. I think it'd be hilarious. And you know, if we like them, we'll bring we'll bring them up in the show. It's just funny. Uh, this one comes from Graham Patterson, who says, uh, "Just caught up with the show. Wonderful. I'll be a regular viewer." And th this is basically we're patting ourselves on the back with airing this comment. Yay! <laughs> the biggest Go thing us. that has happened in my lifetime was the amazing Apollo program of the late '60s and early '70s. I was five at the time. This show captures some of the excitement about human exploration. I can give it no bigger compliment. Best wishes from a fellow space enthusiast and supporter in far away Great Britain. Not that far away. Uh, the planet that's 500 uh, light years away. That, that's far away. Further. Great Britain, right across the pond. Right <laughs> uh, so thank you thank very much. You. That is why we are here. We are here to get humanity excited and inspired about going to the stars. Be it whatever means that may be. The Space Launch System, sure. Uh, SpaceX, sure. Orbital, sure. Mastin, absolutely. Whatever it takes to get humans out to the stars <laughs> and out there permanently, we are behind that. 155,218%. This one comes from... Uh, could, shirt. could you uh, read this one for me? I'm losing my ability. Yeah, here. not a problem. Uh, this one comes from uh, Monokman? Monokem? Monokem? I don't know. I'm sure what we will be uh, told how to say that a little bit later. A community getting together to decide how to allocate resources is exactly what a government is. There is a lot of bashing government and politics going on in the show and associated comment sections. I would like to point out point out, yeah, that government and politics are great and awesome things. They are the very things that enable humanity to do great things like space exploration. Without them, we would be lucky to have agriculture, let alone rocket travel. We would be too busy defending our families from raiders, and even if we weren't, we would be disorganized to do anything awesome. Um, yeah, no, uh, that's funny, because I read this comment thinking, I don't feel as though we've been doing a lot of government bashing per se. We do rail on SLS. Well, we do on SLS, on the space slash Senate launch system. Um, but, I had to get that in there. <laughs> but uh, I, I feel as though it's because, like you said in a little comment earlier, that this is politics getting in the way of science. That's the issue that we have. Um, but go organized government in general, yeah, absolutely. The other nice thing is that I live in a free country where I am allowed to express my opinions as such. Uh, thank you, government. So, yeah, it's this is, while it's a little bit of a first world problem, uh, I guess I live in a first world country, and so I am voicing my opinion. But you don't have to agree with that, and that's perfectly acceptable, too. And we like that you don't always agree with us, because otherwise this would be really boring. Um, <laughs> I, I don't actually necessarily disagree with the comment. I think we do maybe uh, bash government and bash um, SLS too much. And uh, we haven't necessarily given it a fair shot. And I'm going to make a, uh, an effort to do that less. Um, I do still believe that it is very expensive, and I'm, I'm not convinced that it is the right program. But... As I said a moment ago, any program that gets humanity out to the stars and allows us to stay out in the stars, that's good. So um, I'm hoping that SLS will, and the U.S. government, will show how they can sustain SLS from a financial standpoint and continue to do it, and it's not just flags and footprints. Um, I think that's fundamentally our, our, the key issue here. It doesn't matter if NASA's building, and NASA's filled with extremely talented, awesome individuals who can do amazing things. And it doesn't matter if it's private space or government space. Whoever's doing it is, is well, doing it. They're, They're helping humanity. Uh, and so that's what we're all about. And, um, it, you know, I, I guess the, the government bashing comes in from when they're preventing us from doing it, when they're making silly choices, when they're forcing the scientists to do things that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the idea that government is fundamentally a good thing is not wrong. Our roads are provided by the government. This f clean drinking water that we have here, we buy bottled water, our water is terrible. Uh, but regardless, our clean drinking water that we have here that we totally take for granted, provided by the government. Electricity, it's just assumed that we will have electricity, provided by the government. Internet, not provided by the government. So, and look at how messed up that is. Yeah, so, dude. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> um, the comment is not wrong. It's uh, no, not totally not wrong. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, there are pros and cons to everything in life. 
Uh, same thing with government, and it's easy to complain about something like government, and I think sometimes it's harder to look at the good sides of it. And um, yeah, so there you go. All right, I'd like to thank everyone so much for joining this week. Uh, you guys have been an awesome audience. Uh, for those of you watching live, um, we are not going to be doing an After Dark uh, this week, although the open may may go anyhow. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be heading out and. Uh, we're going to try to do a show again next week. Uh, it's every Saturday at 2100 UTC. Now, uh, in the Reddit community, subreddit that we have, which is uh, Reddit, uh, slash r slash tmro, uh, we asked, would you guys like it if we moved the show to uh, uh, like 1900 or 1800 UTC? Um, I'd like to open that up a little bit more. What day in time would you like us to see, do Space Vidcast, right? So, Plus it where, wherever you want. I'll, I'll, I'll combine all of it together and kind of create a grid. But in your time zone and, and what you're doing, what would be the perfect like one hour slot for you to watch live? And then I'm gonna put that together. The thought process being here, um, there's always it's always gonna be inconvenient for someone because we're a worldwide show. So no matter how hard you try, it's midnight somewhere. But if we can make it midnight over a large swath of the ocean, and we can actually do the show at a time that makes sense for a good chunk of the world population that would be willing to watch and mm -hmm. willing and able to watch and mm -hmm. wants to watch live. Mm -hmm. um, that would be good. Um, it, it might be difficult to do. It might be impossible. But I, I like to at least run that calculation and see what makes the most sense. So what makes sense for you? What time do you want to see us do this show? Leave it on YouTube. Email it to me. Drop it on patreon.com slash tmro, wherever you want. Whatever you th whatever you think makes sense, and then I'll I'll combine that, and we'll we'll see what we can do to figure out what the time of the show should be. On that note, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, and have a great week.